Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Autism Stories. I'm your host, Doug Bletcher, the founder of Autism Personal Coach. Autistic people are the true experts of the autistic experience, and Autism Stories is where we interview autistic people to learn from their stories, experiences, and get their advice. If you would like to be notified about each week's episode of Autism Stories, we suggest you subscribe on your favorite podcast listening platform. We would also appreciate it if you could give us a positive rating and review, as it will help others to learn about Autism Stories. Something that I've wanted to talk a lot more about here on Autism Stories because it isn't discussed nearly often enough, and it's a really important part of our lives as autistic adults, and that is being autistic and having sex. That's why I'm excited to talk with Carol Jean Whittington today. Carol Jean joins this episode to discuss autistics and sex, her podcast for late identified autistics, and how to flip the script on a high-conflict conversation online. We hope you enjoy today's conversation. Carol Jean, thanks so much for joining me today. Oh, I am thrilled to be here, Doug. I always love talking to you. We always have a great conversation. I'm sure this will be no different. Uh, (laughs) We do. Now, starting out, um, just wanting to learn more about your story. Story. Where does that begin in the autism community? And that starts back when I was 39, going through the identification process with my son, who was 10 at the time. And we had started the journey of recognizing that he was neurodistinct when he was five, in, or had just turned five. He was in preschool. And in that journey, that five years from when we started to sort of when he was identified and we were at a neuropsychology office and we were, we had gone through this whole process together. And of course, you know, as the parent, they give you all of the things to fill out, answer the questions on behalf of your child and, you know, your experiences and things. And throughout that, I would read these questions and go, oh, well, I experienced that. I've done that. And it was uh, sort of an interesting thing because it, this, you know, me being me, it didn't register right yet. It didn't quite, the penny hadn't dropped. And we had gone for the report session at the end of all of this to sort of get, you know, hey, this is all of the answers you've been looking for to help your child. And we're sitting there and he looks at me over his little half glasses and his gray hair and his little sport coat. And he says, you know you were missed. And I was like, no, I wasn't. Nobody missed me. I'm right here. <laughs> and he just sort of chuckles and looked at me and said, it took a few minutes. And about halfway through that conversation, I, thought, I looked at him and said, are you saying I'm autistic? And he said, you need to come back and see me. <laughs> and I was like, oh. So it started to kind of like percolate through the soil. And what was interesting is, you know, I thought, well, if I was missed and these are all the things that, you know, occupational therapy and, and integrated listening system. And these are the things that, that will help my child who is so very similar to me. And we have very similar experiences up to this point. And I'm recognizing myself in a lot of, of his life and himself. And, and I thought, oh, I, I, I got to make sure if I missed all this and I know how much I've struggled, I know how difficult my life has been I don't want him to have that you know because we always want better for our children so I spent the next two years doing everything that you know they anything anybody suggested that was going to help that was going to make things easier that was going to help him in any way we did it um you know thankfully we were very fortunate in that the neuropsychologist that we saw did not ever suggest ABA that was not something even the pediatrician ever suggested. So we really, because I had no idea, so we really were very fortunate in that respect. But at the end of that two years, I had probably hit the worst burnout of my life. And at 41, I said, oh, I think it's time for me to focus on me. I think I need to look into that aspect of myself being autistic and figure out what it means for me. And that's sort of where all this started. 
Now, uh, since that time, you uh, have become the founder of the Mind Your Autistic Brain community. For those that may not be familiar of that community, what is the mission of Mind Your Autistic Brain? Mind Your Autistic Brain helps late identified adults go from burnout and struggling to thriving and living their very best life on their terms without having to mask all the time in community, relationships, or work. And one of the things that Mind Your Autistic Brain does that I was a part of recently is the Mind Your Autistic Brain podcast. I said a bunch of stuff on there. Uh, I, don't, I don't remember anything I said. Hopefully it wasn't too awful. Uh, so so I believe the, uh, the last time I checked out the podcast, you had uh, 85 episodes. So from one podcaster to another, what have you learned about podcasting? in this process. Oh my goodness. Um, it was interesting. It started out as just a podcast and, and I wasn't really sure where it was going to go. I just knew I wanted to spotlight and have conversations that were going to help other people. And really I stopped maybe about six months to a year in and I went, you know, the format, it's good, but I want something a little more. So I started to structure it and it became a talk show. And really what I focus on is having conversations with other people that are late identified autistic ADHDers. But I also started talking to other people outside that may or may not be autistic in areas and fields that impact our lives and our journey in late identified life. So one of the things I think that I've learned more than anything else is that everyone has an incredible story. They have a journey. They have their own hero's journey to share. And just being able to spotlight that and to highlight the wonderful people and the voices in our community, that has just been, I think, more empowering me than perhaps any guest. And I hope that, you know, I think we hit 30,000 downloads last week in 76 countries. So apparently it's helping other people uh, from the messages that I get every week and every day. To me, that's probably been the, the biggest thing I've learned is that, you know, other people's voices impact me more than I ever thought they would. Now, a lot of what you do is through social media and you've hosted a really interesting conversation lately that I wish I could have attended. I think I was traveling um, as it was going on. So the the session was titled, How to Flip the Script on a High Conflict Conversation Online, which that's something um, that probably happens too many times to count every day online. So if some of our listeners like me, um, you know, that want to learn more about how to kind of navigate those situations online, what would be some of your advice to them? Oh, gosh. Uh, This was part of the live community event series that I do every month. So I try and do it the last Thursday of every month. And we have a a live community Zoom event where we talk about a topic that really is impacting a lot of lives currently and, you know, sort of those hot topic things. And when it comes to high conflict or emotionally charged situations online, that's something that really can heat up and it can get out of control and it can also be very isolating and very divisive. And one of the things that uh, my guest and I, Dr. Scott Fraser, talked about was how do you, and this is his hashtag, which I love, flip the script. And really what we started looking at in conversations and, and things that we were both seeing and some research that we were doing was that when things were escalating, when someone made a comment or they stated a position online, people either aligned with it and cheered it and agreed with it, or it was Mm. the other side and it was, I disagree with you. I don't agree with this. This isn't something I believe. And then people were just simply fighting for their rightness to be heard. And ultimately what it came down to is that no matter what the person's position or belief was, they simply wanted to be heard and acknowledged as a person. So what, what Scott and I found was in, in our own experiences in this 
was that getting compassionately curious. And I think we do that so beautifully as autistics. We are compassionately curious. We're very curious. But one of the things that sometimes gets gets us and, and we get stuck in is that we're very just-minded. And if someone says, this is the rule or this is the belief or this is how something is, we have agreed to it and that's how it is. It's black and white. And one of the things in late identified life, I was a very stringent black and white thinker. And so I probably isolated and myself a lot and probably offended and pushed away a lot of people because I was like, this is how it is. And, but that was because I didn't see or recognize that there were these areas of gray in there and that we could hold two different opinions on this similar subject and we could both be right. And just being able to step back in those situations because it does build in our body. We have a visceral physical response. And in that moment to just step back and to also know that we don't have to comment or respond (laughs) on anything. (laughs) No, you don't. But I think it's interesting. You mentioned that you mentioned the word curiosity because, you know, I, 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 I see these things all the time and I think, you know, someone types a message, you know, it's a hundred, 50 characters or something. And what happens is we just see that information from that person. A lot of times we know nothing else about that person and we don't know their story. And I love that that's, that you bring that around is that we don't know their story. And that's part of the compassionate curiosity is to ask those questions to in a non threatening way. Like you don't want to put somebody's back up against the wall, but when you're approaching it from compassionate curiosity, what you say is, you know, I, I hear what you're saying and I'm very curious. Could you share with me or would you be open to sharing with me what experiences or, or information that you have that, that helped you form this? Because I'd like to know, maybe I'm missing something. And it's amazing because just in one or two turns of a conversation like that, it completely de-escalates someone feeling like they need to argue and fight for their rightness to a place of, I'm just sharing why I feel that way. And this is what I experienced. And from the receiving end of that, you can go, oh, wow, you know, I never thought of that or I didn't experience it that way. I had a different experience and this is what I experienced. And in that exchange, you're both connecting and seeing, which is ultimately what we all want as humans, to be seen for who we are and and to be acknowledged in our existence. Now, sometimes I think uh, for the most part, I'm good about just avoiding these situations in general, but, but sometimes it's impossible to avoid these things. So for those that might find themselves in conflict online, I'm wondering if you have any suggestions on how people can just kind of flip the script in, in those situations. Number one, don't respond when you are physically way up, when you are feeling a very visceral, emotional, strong emotion in the moment. Stop the keyboard. (laughs) Go for a walk. (laughs) Step away from it. Go have a conversation with a close, trusted friend. Get it out. Do not respond until you feel that you are in a neutral place of emotion where you are not feeling really over the top. I mean, you can still be feeling something a little bit, but don't feel like you're like supercharged, number one. That's my number one tip. Do not respond in the heat of the moment. That is not where you are responding from your higher critical thinking brain, folks. You are actually responding from your your reptilian fight, flight, freeze, or fawn brain, and it is not going to go well. It never does. It will backfire in a second, and then it just gets worse from there because then you can also get to that place where you're like, oh, God, I can't believe I said that, and I can't take it back. (laughs) Somebody already read it. Don't do it. Trust me. Take it from me. Don't do it. Uh, the other thing is once you do get to that place where you're like, okay, I, I, I'm in a place where I can rationally think through this and articulate, 
you know, a, a dialogue in this without attacking or, or just making this into a dumpster fire, right? Because sometimes it's already a flaming dumpster fire by the time you circle back. And at that point, you just need to kind of ask yourself, do I want to contribute to the fire and fan mm-hmm. the flames? Or would it just be best served to just walk away from this one? Like, because sometimes if it has, it has like gone into dumpster fire, flaming, you know, three alarm bell situation, at that point, no one is listening. No one's having a conversation and contributing anything, even from a level head, isn't going to change that. But there are times where you could maybe in a separate situation, maybe there's somebody in there and, and you see something and you're like, Hey, I just really, you know, reach out in a DM and just say, Hey, I was really curious. You know, I saw that you, you posted this and I saw kind of, this was kind of getting out of hand, but, but I wanted to talk to you directly because I'd like to have a conversation if you're open for it to understand, you know, why you feel this way, because maybe I'm not seeing something and I'd really like to know if there's something that I'm not seeing about this. It just going from that place is, is my biggest suggestion in that. And, you know, cause you can't avoid it all together. Believe me, I'm a, I'm a <laughs> conflict avoider at all costs if I can help it. You know, I'm like, is, do I have a dog in this fight? And that's the other thing we have to ask ourselves too, is does this pertain to me? Is this, do I really have a dog in this fight or mm. is this something that it's just something that really doesn't pertain to me and I just let that go? I, I also wonder be, about, about how alexithymia um, affects these situations and so many of the differences that that all of us have. So just even with like the advice you gave of just stepping away, just even to process the information that you're that you're receiving <laughs> i have alexithymia and, and i process slower i also have an auditory processing delay so for me sometimes it's not i'm not going to get that emotional download that i can translate into something that i'm understanding and assigning my emotion to i might just be feeling it really big and i might be feeling a ton of stuff all at one time and it can be very overwhelming Um, in those situations, it's sometimes difficult because timing sometimes is a factor. And for me, I don't always have the the time that I need to process something out before somebody is like back trying to get an answer from me. So when that happens, what I've done and what I started doing is I just simply say, I need time to process this before I respond. Please be patient. I know that you're waiting. I know that you're looking for a reply on this, but I do need a little time to think about it. And as soon as I have gotten some clarity on how I'm feeling, I'll come back to you. Please know that I am thinking on this and I am working to process how I'm feeling this. And I want you to know that what you've said matters to me and I don't want to just respond in haste. Now, something else that you're doing this month that that I was really excited to see is hosting a series that talks about autistic sex. So this is something that needs to be talked about so much more, probably talked about every day. Uh, Why do you think people seem to be so afraid to talk about the autistic experience as it's related to sex? I think there are a lot of reasons, Doug. Number one... We have such a variety with sexual identification within our community. And for the most part, we in the West are very conservative. And there's all these societal norms, even globally, there are societal norms about sex. And so, and discussing sex and having conversations in mixed company, quote unquote, (laughs) Um, you know, men and women together having these conversations. There's so much within our autistic experience from sexual identity to alexithymia to sensory processing to our experience with sensory input and output. The combination of ADHD that factors in for many of us uh, who are also autistic, 
that I think there's just not a lot of clarity in a lot of ways. And people also are holding on to a lot of internalized shame from societal norms and beliefs. Uh, and I'm hoping that in starting this conversation on touching mm-hmm. on, hey, you know, so many of us in this community identify as being asexual. And a lot of times that can be attributed to alexithymia. That can be part of the ADHD dopamine experience if you feel like you might be hypersexual. Um, you know, there's just all these different variations. And I think people just sometimes don't know how to start the conversation or they're afraid to start the conversation. Um, you know, some of the things that have come up in this in this wonderful month of autistic sex and discussing it is that we do have sex, folks. Number one, there's lots of us who love to have sex. Um, and, you know, a lot of times uh, I have a friend of mine and he's like, I can't tell you how many times I've had people realize or, or discover that I'm a dad, that I'm, a, you know, that I have a spouse, that we have two kids. And they're like, how'd you get kids? And he's like, how do you think we're going to <laughs> <laughs> It's like there's this... Somehow there's this belief in the, in the neuromajority world that we don't have sex, like sex, or want to have sex. There's lots of us that really enjoy it. And then there's also just that a lot of us experience and like to experience sex in very different or specific ways because of our sensory preferences and needs. Um, you know, if that goes from you know, BDSM, where there's very clear-cut directions and there's rules there's, you know, body compression. You know, some people like to have that pressure. Some people don't. It needs to be, you know, in a very sensory appropriate for them situation where, you know, the sheets have to be just so, the lighting has to be just so, you know, and it's very, please touch me like this. Don't touch me here. Um, I have to have these certain things and, and I have to have this time before or after physical engagement for myself just to either prepare and transition, you know, to go from one activity to the next. Hello, ADHDers out there have that transition time. And these are all components that we experience that vary from the neuromajority sexual experience. And I think the more we can talk about it and the more we can start having a dialogue around this and sharing with one another what we experience and, and what we like and what we don't like, uh, what we've gone through in the process of our own sexual identification, I think it just, it changes the world and it frees us up from so much self-doubt. It frees us up from a lot of internalized shame that we can just let go of. It doesn't serve us and it empowers us to live our best thriving life when we can step into what serves us and what aligns with us, especially sexually are some of the topics um, in the autistic sex series that you've already covered and those that you'll be covering uh, uh, throughout the rest of the month? Oh gosh, we talk about sex from the sensory perspective of what types of touch, uh, different levels of arousal, learning to, because for a lot of us, this has been a real big challenge, recognizing those sensations in our body. And being able to sort of sit with it, because a lot of times we get uncomfortable and we're like, okay, I don't know what to do with that, so I'm just going to push it away. But just allowing ourselves to really experience our bodies and to connect and identify what those are. Uh, We have talked, I had Amy Gravino on the show, and I know you guys have have spoken with her, Uh, John Michael Carley, and we're actually talking at the end of June in the series. diving in and doing like a Q&A with the author because we, he talks about like the different parts of our body specifically. I mean, we all have a backside, so you know, that's one of the areas that we're talking about. Um, we talk about sex in neurodiverse relationships. If you have a neuromajority partner and a neurodistinct partner, um, what about we talk about relationships when both partners are neurodistinct sort of also just how does this evolve within our relationships, but also how does this revolve, evolve in the relationships we have with ourselves? So we also talk about that. Um, we talk about aging and how sex changes as we age. You know, for those of us who are women, 
you know, perimenopause and menopause, how does this start to affect your sex? You know, men in aging, testosterone and things change. And so how we experience sex in our 20s is not how we experience sex in our 40s or 50s and beyond. So we have also had that conversation this month. So we've had a lot happening. And how can people learn more about the Autistic Sex Series and the Mind Your Autistic Brain community? Mind Your Autistic Brain can be found at www.socialaudie.com. And there is an events page on our Member Vault site that houses all of the events for the month of June in Autistic Sex. You can find the talk show on all major podcast platforms as well as on YouTube. And the replays are available on all of those platforms where you can, if you're a visual person, if you're an auditory person, and I know for a lot of us, we like to listen and speed stuff up to where our brain processes that a little better. So those, all of those are available. And uh, on the block, on the Mind Your Autistic Brain blog, it's called the Brain Dump uh, newsletter and blog. There's also all types of information there in the newsletter with all of the links for June. Well, I will definitely be checking out some of those replays for sure. Well, Carol Jean, it was it was a pleasure talking to you as always. Thanks so much for um, your time today and for joining me on Autism Stories. Oh, Doug, I couldn't have thought of a better way to spend my Tuesday morning, and I've been looking forward to this for weeks, <laughs> and I loved our conversation. Can't wait for yours to air on the Mind Your Autistic Brain talk show. Thanks so much to Carol Jean for the conversation. To learn more about Carol Jean, check out the link in the podcast description for this episode. Whether it's about developing or improving relationships online or in person, Autism Personal Coach can help you. We provide autistic adults and teens with extraordinary support to live self-sufficient and purpose-driven lives through our customized coaching. So if this is something that interests you, then please visit AutismPersonalCoach.com for more information. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Autism Stories, and if you did, if you could tell a friend, foe, or anyone you know about it so they could have the same enjoyable experience as you, when listening to Autism Stories, it would be very much appreciated. Until next time, I'm Doug Bletcher of Autism Personal Coach. Talk to you then.